Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, this morning, we will be hearing evidence from uh, Elizabeth Evans-Jones. Uh, uh, but earlier today, a few further documents were provided for her to consider. Uh, and I would ask that we could uh, adjourn her evidence by 15 minutes to allow a, a bit more time for her to consider those documents. Yes, of course, uh, Mr. Stevens. So we'll um, begin as soon after 10.15 as you think appropriate. I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. Right. Sir, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you for the time. If I may call Ms. Evans-Jones. Would you like to repeat after me? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Good morning. As you know, my name is Sam Stevens, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Please, could you state your full name? Elizabeth Jane Evans Jones. Firstly, thank you for giving evidence to the inquiry, both in a written statement, which we'll turn to today, and also for attending to give oral evidence and considering the additional documents that we uh, gave to you this morning. Um, you should have a written statement in front of you uh, in the bundle of documents. Uh, under tab A. Uh, did you have that there? I do, yes. Yes, and it runs to 21 pages. It does indeed, yes. On page 16, there should be a final paragraph 43, mm -hmm. and beneath that, uh, a statement of truth and your signature. Is that your signature? I can confirm it is, yes. And can you confirm that the contents of that statement are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. That stands as evidence in the inquiry now. And uh, for the transcript, the reference is WITN 0668 uh, I'm going to ask you some more questions about it, but not cover everything that, that's okay. within it. Uh, firstly, by way of background, you graduated in 1999. I did. And you joined Fujitsu in October 2005 to work on the post office account. That's correct, yes. Uh, and you were a service delivery team manager. I was, yes. Could I, if you could just move it slightly closer to the microphone, if you don't, it's just, thank you, that's very, very grateful. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, prior to that role, mm -hmm. could you summarise any qualifications that you had that were relevant to uh, carrying out that job? So um, I was ITIL certified um, version 3 expert. So um, that's the IT infrastructure library, which is, delivers best practice in terms of how to manage and deliver services. And what experience, work experience or professional experience had you had in delivering a role like that prior to joining Fujitsu? So prior to joining Fujitsu, I worked in Threadneedle Asset Management, where I ran the service management department for a period of time. I was also a change, release and configuration manager. Um, and previous to that, I worked for Yellow Pages, also in ITIL service management functions. And uh, when the role came, came up for you to join Fujitsu, mm -hmm. do you recall uh, how you were selected for it? Um, I was uh, recommended by um, a colleague who used to work, I was put forward, who I used to work with at Threadneedle, he put me forward through to the application for Fujitsu, I then went through um, two or three rounds of interviews um, with Fujitsu and then I was selected for the role. You stayed in the role on the post office account until December 2007. That's correct and then you moved to a different account, but within Fujitsu. That's correct, yes. When you were working for that different account from mm -hmm. December 2007 onwards, mm -hmm. did you have any more uh, working or, or dealing with the post office account? Um, n not from a, um, a work perspective. Obviously, I had colleagues that I interacted with, but not from a work perspective. So when you finished in... Uh, on the post office account in December 2007. Mm -hmm. That's your last dealings with the Horizon and the post office Correct. account. Correct. 
and uh, you you left Fujitsu in August 2010. Uh, uh, December. Uh Yes, August 2010, that's correct, yes. I want to look at support services generally mm -hmm. first. You're primarily going to talk about what was known as either the Horizon System Help Desk or mm -hmm. the Horizon Service Desk. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to refer to it as the Help Desk okay. uh, for, for today. And that is, was first line support. Correct. And from uh, an IT background, what well, how would you describe the purpose of first-line support? Um, from a, an ITIL perspective, it's intended to be the single point of contact for clients to interact with an organisation, be that for um, software, hardware, uh, or general queries. Um, the desk should then log the, um, the, the incident um, so that it's captured from a volumetric perspective, attempt to troubleshoot and resolve at first point of contact, if not are possible to resolve, then to refer that through to second or third line support, depending on the processes. So, um, trying to resolve one of the purposes is to try to resolve the issue at first line, mm -hmm. and then, if not possible, refer up to the second line or, or third line. Yeah. In on the post office account, uh, second line support we understand was provided by the Systems Management Centre or SMC. Uh, depending on the nature of the incident. So second line support for a hardware fault would be potentially engineering services, but for software, yeah, absolutely, through to um, the SSC, I believe the team was called. Um, so the, the SSC, we, we've heard about the SSC at third line. <laughs> Can you recall the SSC, the System Support Centre? I, I don't recall what the, which was first and which was second and which was third line. But for second line support, mm -hmm. let's, let's deal with that as a matter of generality first. Mm -hmm. From an IT perspective, what does the second line support do? What's its purpose? Um, the purpose of second line support is to take an incident which can't be resolved at the service desk at first point of contact and investigate further, attempt to resolve, uh, and if resolution is not possible, then to pass that through to third line support. And. In terms of, I'm not sure if you can say this is a matter of generality, <laughs> but uh, in terms of proportions of problems that mm -hmm. should be resolved at first line or at second line or at third line, is there a general rule of thumb mm -hmm. as to wh how many incidents should be capable of being resolved by first line support and then second line? Uh, speaking in general terms, no, it depends very much on the nature of the service that's been provided, um, the access that a service desk may have. Um, so, no, I, I don't believe it's possible to generalise um, to say how much should be resolved at first point of contact. Please, can we uh, turn to your witness statement? Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, paragraph 14 on page 4. Mm -hmm. say that to explain your role, uh, I will briefly outline Fujitsu core services mm -hmm. and account model as it was in existence when I was employed by the company. At this point in time, services in Fujitsu were either provided by core services or were account-owned services. Uh, please could you explain what Fujitsu core services were? Um, absolutely. I tried to articulate in the, in the following paragraph, in paragraph 15. So core services were services that would be provided to multiple accounts. So the examples that I gave in, in paragraph 15 would be, for example, a service desk or engineering services. Um, and the reason for that was that they were um, activities that could be customised for particular accounts. So a service desk has very much the same purpose for one account as for another account. Um, engineering, again, very much the same purpose for one account or for another account. Um, so Fujitsu at the time um, had the, the, the model of having these core services accounts um, and then anything that was very specific to um, an, an account, for example, in post office, would be part of the account team. Um, one of the key differentiators there is the fact that the resource and the management of those services resided with core services and the core services management structure, whereas any account-owned services resided with the account um, for its management and its, its, its performance levels. You, you're quite right. You do say in your statement that the, the help desk was a, a core service. Mm -hmm. So in, 
does that mean that the, the people who were dealing with help desk inquiries mm -hmm. sitting on the phones would also be dealing with calls from related to different accounts? No. 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 So they were ring fence resources that were dedicated to post office. They were trained to support the post office account. Um, but the management structure was under core services. So the operations manager sat in core services, again, ring-fenced for post office account. Um, there were other accounts sitting in core services where there were shared services, but post office account was not one of those. The, the resources were dedicated to post office account, could, oh, supporting post office. On that point, please, could we bring up FUJ 30804.78? And page eight, please. Uh, this is a, a document concerning the Horizon Service Desk, mm -hmm. um, a, a described as a joint working document. Uh, if we could go, just go to the bottom of this page, please, just to get the date. See, it's the 4th of September, 2008. Uh, and if we could focus in on paragraph 2.4, please. It says Fujitsu services may provide a non-dedicated service desk function sharing the resource with other Fujitsu services customers as described within this service desk service description. So is it the case that it was Fujitsu may be entitled to have a service desk which dealt with other Fujitsu accounts, mm -hmm. but from your time there and your recollection, it did not, in fact, do that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I guess that, that's the nature of core services. Shared services desks could be put in place, but for post office account, it was a dedicated desk due to the size of the, the account. Um, that document can go. Do you recall how many people were available to work in the help desk whilst you were working there? Um, I, I don't have a recollection as to how many people. Do you recall the types of minimum qualifications that a person would need to be employed on the horizon? Um, again, I don't recall the qualifications. Um, I wasn't involved in the selection of the resources to go onto the service desk. Um, I can speculate that it was due to it was the, the client engagement, the um, ability to communicate effectively with end callers to be able to deal with sometimes challenging conversations um, but in and um, IT um, experience and again that would be my speculation based on my experience of running other service desks. Would you again yeah I appreciate you don't have knowledge of what these people actually required or what mm -hmm. the qualifications were but in terms of, w from your experience, would you expect that people working on the help desk would need some form of IT qualification? Yes. And what level would that be? Uh, again, it depends on the, the service desk that's been supported um, and the, ne the level of technicality of the service desk. But fundamental understanding of, of IT services would be, in my opinion, a requirement to be on, a, uh, on an IT service desk. And was there anything about this help desk, the Horizon help desk, that took, took it out of the norm that meant more advanced qualifications were needed or, or less? No, um, the opposite. Um, the, the Horizon service desk, from my recollection, had very limited opportunity to resolve um, at the first point of contact. Um, so uh, from my recollection, a lot of the calls that came through were related to hardware. Um, a, sim a reboot was the, the, the maximum that the service desk could do there, and that would be dispatched to engineers. There was also a knowledge base um, that laid out step-by-step -step instructions as to what the service desk could do. Um, but to my, um, uh, the best of my recollection, the IT service desk, the Horizon service desk, was not a technical service desk, not particularly technical. I certainly want to come to explore some of those issues shortly. Mm -hmm. be before doing that, do you recall the training that was made available to members of the Horizon help desk? 
Um, I, I don't. I know that there was training, and I, I refer to that in my statement. Um, I, I, I know there was a training um, program put in place. I don't recall the duration, nor do I in recall the content of that. Do you know who would be responsible for ensuring that members of the Horizon Service Help Desk were, sorry, Horizon System Help Desk were <laughs> properly trained? The operations manager for the Horizon Service Desk in core services. And who was that during your time there? Uh, Paul Gardner, I believe, his, was his name. Before moving on, uh, if you can help us with this core or account, mm -hmm. so core services or, or account services, um, do you remember whether the uh, second line support SMC would be core or, or, or account services? Um, I, I don't recall. Um, I, I don't recall. Let's move to look at your role then as a service delivery team manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, we don't need to bring it up, but paragraph 17a, you say that you managed a team of service delivery managers mm -hmm. uh, who provided both core services and account owned services. How many people did you, or, or uh, service delivery managers, did you manage? Um, I believe it was around eight or nine service managers. It changed over the two years. Um, eight or nine is my recollection. Uh, how many of those would be um, responsible for work relevant to the Horizon help desk? Uh, I had um, one service delivery manager who was the key interface for the Horizon service desk. Who was that? Um, I, I don't recall his name. The, 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 the role changed. Um, Ian Mills, I believe, at one point, was involved in the Horizon Service Desk. Um, I don't recall the name. And uh, what was his day-to-day sort of -day responsibility for the Service Desk? Yeah, so he would interface with, he would, he would almost be the conduit between the account team and the core services team that provided the Horizon Service Desk. Um, so he would, Ian or, or other people who held that role, would be looking at the, the metrics, for the service desk metrics, in terms of average speed of answer, um, dealing with any escalations that came through, um, making sure that the, the desk was resourced appropriately. So he would work very closely with the operations manager for the Horizon service desk, and also interact. He was the representation and interaction with post office as well. Um, we had operational reviews around the Horizon service desk performance. Did the operations manager report to you? Paul Gardner. Paul Gardner. No. Who did Paul Gardner report to? Um, his management structure in core services. And who did you report to? The head of service delivery management for post office account. Let's look then in more detail at, at the help desk itself. Mm -hmm. Please could we bring up your witness statement again, page five, paragraph 17a. Mm -hmm. You set out your role um, was to, as you said, to manage the team of, of SDMs and, mm -hmm. and in respect of the Horizon Service Desk, involve engaging with the core services operations manager uh, to ensure delivery against the agreed performance metrics for the first line desk and improvement of the service, mm -hmm. ensuring that the core service function was in line with the profit and loss business case, the Horizon Service Desk uh, service delivery manager also managed escalations from uh, Post Office Limited on the performance of the service desk with the core services team. Mm -hmm. um, so, in terms of, is it fair to say, in terms of both, your responsibilities were both for the volumetrics in the sense of how many calls were answered, the speed of the calls, mm -hmm. was the quality of the advice provided also within your um, responsibility? Yes, yeah, so, so to clarify, the, the actual achievement of those performance metrics sat with the operations manager in core services, as did the quality. In the event that those metrics dropped down or the quality dropped down, that would then be discussed by myself and by the Horizon Service Desk SDM, and we would work collaboratively with core services to implement improvements to address the quality metrics or to address the 
the, the performance metrics as well. Um, and as you know, as mentioned in my statement, if we received escalations from post office on the quality or um, on the performance metrics, we would work collaboratively to address those. So there were the three parties involved in the process, the core services team, the account team, and post office limited. So um, it, just for, to make sure I've got this, uh, the operations manager, Paul Gardner, mm -hmm. he had day-to-day -day responsibility for ensuring that the quality and volumetrics were to the required standard. Yep. Um, you would monitor that mm -hmm. and step in when there was a drop mm -hmm. and come up with ways or, or devise strategies to improve it to get it back to the contractually agreed level of service. Yeah. There was almost the layers of accountability. So Paul was accountable from the service desk. Myself and my team were accountable to post office for those quality uh, and the service metrics. We had to ensure the service was delivered in line with the contractual metrics. Uh, so in, in, so in doing that role, whilst not <coughs> immediately day-to-day -day responsible for the service desk, mm -hmm. you had awareness of its operation and its function. Absolutely, yeah. Turning then to its function, you, you state in your witness statement, you, you say that the, uh, this is paragraph 20, um, the HSD was primarily a log and flog function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as there were very limited first-line uh, slash level fixes that the desk could complete. Yep. Can I ask you to expand on log and flog? Yeah, so uh, as referred to, the, the, the Horizon service desk really had limited opportunity to resolve at first point of contact. Um, so log and flog is a, a, a generic term used in, in the industry, which is basically to log a ticket and then pass it through to the next level of support, be that hardware, software, or, or query management. Uh, why were, was um, sorry, why were there such limited first line fixes available for the Horizon Service Desk? So a large number of the incidents that were logged were hardware related. Again, as I've articulated, very little could be done on a hardware issue apart from to try and reboot the counter. If, um, uh, if the counter was down, that caused an issue for the post office. So the the approach that was taken if the reboot didn't work and that normally took about 20 minutes we dispatched the engineer to get an engineer on site quickly as possible to allow the, the, the branch to trade again uh, a single counter branches was obviously more critical than multi counter branches again with keypads um, and again the from my understanding that there was very limited software fixes that the desk could do anyway um, be, because uh, I don't believe that they had access to, to to fix anything with the software they'd look in the knowledge base um, if there was no immediate resolution that was documented in that, they would then pass that through to second-line support or third-line support. And again, something else we will come to in, <laughs> in due course. But uh, the, the types of calls, let's just cover that for, for a moment. You said uh, there were a lot of hardware mm -hmm. calls. Yeah. The inquiry, has heard, the inquiry has heard a significant amount of uh, evidence from sub-postmasters. Uh, who stated that they faced discrepancies in their accounts which mm -hmm. were um, generated by Horizon. Do you recall there being a significant number of calls relating to discrepancies which came into the help desk? Um, I, I would only have the, the, the classification of which the ticket was logged against, the power help code. Um, I don't uh, no, for, um, for the best of my recollection, I'm not sure there was a code that specifically called out discrepancy, so um, I, I don't know. From my recollection, the bulk of the calls that came through were hardware-related calls or branch services were offline, um, as in the, the, the BT network that was put in place to the post office was offline, which meant the branch couldn't trade. Um, Please, can we just bring up paragraph 41 of your witness statement at page 16? Yeah. Thank you. In, here you say that as a result of some of the escalated incidents, which I had directed to the software team, I was aware that it had been reported by SPMs that the system could cause branch discrepancies. However, I do not recall these in detail. Mm -hmm. Can you just summarise when you would become involved in 
uh, these escalated incidents so, and your role? Yeah, escalations generally came from two um, sources. One was post office would escalate to me directly um, or the service desk would escalate to the service delivery manager for that function. Um, and then they would escalate to me if they were unable to resolve that escalation. And you say that you, you aware of the, the reports of um, SBM saying that the uh, system could cause discrepancies. Mm -hmm. uh, was that common knowledge in the help desk uh, of the fact that SBMs were making such allegations? I, I, I'm unable to comment on whether the service desk thought this was common knowledge or not. Um, as I say, the, I, I really have no recollection of whether I knew that or not. And stepping back then from the service desk, amongst your colleagues who you worked with day to day, mm -hmm. was it a known fact that allegations by SBMs were being made uh, that the Horizon system could cause discrepancies? Um, I, again, it's not an area that I was particularly involved in. Um, I think there was some awareness that there were discrepancies. Um, but again, I'm not sure of, of how widely that was known, nor did I have any understanding about the scale of discrepancies that could be caused. We, are you aware of anything uh, that was done to investigate those allegations within Fujitsu? Um, not personally. Uh, as I say, the, my portfolio wasn't around the software. Um, it's my um, speculation that it was being investigated by the second and third line support teams in, soft, in, the, in the software side of the support. I want to look at one of those uh, escalations now and, mm -hmm. and turn to a document which you were given this morning. Um, it's POL 00028984. And if we could go to page 10, please. Uh, and at the bottom. This is an email that the inquiry has seen before. Uh, it's from Sandra McKay to Sean Turner. Uh, and it says, Sean, you may recall that in September, the above office had major problems with their horizon system relating to transfers between stock units. You can go over the page, please. Thank you. The SPMR has reported that he is again experiencing problems with the transfers, oh, sorry, with transfers, 5th of January uh, 06, which resulted in a loss of around £43,000, which has subsequently rectified itself. I know that the SPMR has reported this to Horizon Support, who have come back to him, stating that they cannot find any problem. If we could go then to page 8, please. Uh, and to the bottom. There's an email there from Gary Blackburn uh, to you on the 15th of February 2006. Mm -hmm. Do you recall Gary Blackburn? I do, yeah. Uh, and who was he? Um, he worked on post office. I can't recall his exact role, but he was one of three or four people that I had regular contact with on post office account. Uh, he forwards this email on to you mm -hmm. um, uh, de describing the, the detail and says, could you please update me on the corrective action plan as this still appears to be occurring within the branch? Do you have any recollection of this um, matter? No, the, the first I remember of this is when this document was presented to me this morning. If we go above, your response is... Just move up slightly so we can see the date, please. Thank you. Uh, on the 16th of February, say, hi, Gary, I've checked the call, and this issue is scheduled to be resolved in S90. Um, do you recall what S90 was? I, I don't. Every, if they said it was a release, uh, I, I a software release. release. Yeah. I, I don't recall specifically what it is, no. I appreciate you, you say you can't recall this incident at all, but mm -hmm. what would you? how would you have gained this information to... Um, come back to Gary Blackburn with this response? I would have spoken to the second or third line support, third line in this case, um, for the software support team. 
do you think you would have been concerned that the help desk had initially advised the postmaster uh, that this discrepancy was not a fault in the system uh, when it transpired that it was a software problem? Um, y yes, I believe I would have been concerned. Um, the, 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 the Horizon Service Desk would have followed whatever information was in the knowledge database. Um, so I would have been concerned that the information in the knowledge database would have been incorrect um, and that incorrect advice would have been given to the, the sub-postmaster or the postmaster. Can you recall if any steps were taken to address that concern? Um, the, 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 the KELS, the knowledge articles, were updated on a regular basis. Um, they weren't updated by the service desk. Again, so I can't recall if anything specifically happened in relation to this particular um, incident. However, there was a process to make sure that the KELs were, were updated um, with the latest information. When KELs were updated like mm -hmm. that, was it simply a case of um, there's a KEL on the system, an update has been made, so the next time someone accesses that KEL, mm -hmm. they will see updated information? Or was there a circular sent round to members of the help desk to advise them of any updates? Um, again, uh, I don't recall in detail. Um, I know that the KELs would have been updated and that information, the latest information would have been visible. Um, to the best of my recollection, there was um, a process whereby information was circulated around the service desk, but that wasn't for every single KEL that was updated. Do you have any recollection of which KELs would be. I'm afraid I don't know. At page five uh, of the document, if you could go down slightly, please, uh, to the bottom, I think, actually. Yes, thank you. Um, we see Gary Blackburn emails back you back on the 17th of February. Um, you've got some questions mm -hmm. which are over the, over the page. A bit lower down, I think, please. Thank you. In particular, do, one of them is, do we understand why this particular branch has been having problems, or are there other branches in the network that have been having this problem? And if we go back to, I think it was page five, Down slightly, please. Oh. Yes, thank you there. That, that. Um, you send that on to Mike Stewart. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who Mike Stewart was? Yeah, he was um, a service delivery manager who reported um, to myself um, and worked on online services. And what was the purpose of sending this to him? So he was um, closer to the, the, um, the, the applications and the systems to be able to investigate that. Um, so it was common that I would then distribute the work to the, the people who had more knowledge around, um, uh, around the content of the email. And do you recall, after sending this email, if you had any more involvement with this uh, issue? I, I don't recall the emails, so... Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't believe I had any further involvement. Um, from what I can see from the emails, I was even taken off the email exchange. Um, can we go to page three, please? Uh, and the email from Anne Chambers to Mike Stewart on the 23rd of mm -hmm. February. Uh, this isn't an email you're, you've... You were, well, there's no evidence here to suggest mm -hmm. you were sent this at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to look at the second paragraph, though, uh, which says, haven't looked at the recent evidence, but I know in the past this site had hit this repost lock problem two or three times within a few weeks. This problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks, and finally, as you say, they have done something uh, about it. So this is... It's fair to say, talking about a fairly significant bug in the Horizon system code. It appears that way, yes. Were you aware? Can, were you aware of this at the time, at all? 
as I say, the, the only recollection I have now is from this email that was sent to me, was provided to me this morning. Uh, until this point in time, I had no recollection of the calendar, calendar square issue, nor this repost lock problem. If this information had been given to you at the time, mm -hmm. do you think it's, a, it's something that would have, you would remember now? Uh, absolutely, um, because, you know, it's, it's a significant issue, um, and I would have absolutely done to the best of my ability to make sure we investigated that properly. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's because of the person I am, so. Thank you. That document can come down now. Uh, We'll move on to a different matter, which is the types of calls you were referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. And if we could bring up FUJ 3083429. This is a Fujitsu Services Post Office Account Service Review Book for mm -hmm. February 2007. Could you briefly summarise what this document was or what, what the, the purpose of this um, these types of documents yeah it was a contractual obligation that each month um the fujitsu post office account had to provide this through to post office um and it outlines the performance metrics for the key services that fujitsu provided so there were performance metrics and commentary included in there please can we turn to uh, page 11. <coughs> So this is showing um, for the Horizon Service Desk a, a table, um, unhelpfully in black and white, but we can come to the numbers further down. Uh, but is, is this showing the, essentially showing the metrics for from February 06 to February 2007 for yeah. the service level agreements? Uh, no, this is showing the number of calls in each of those categories. Um, so the number of calls was not a service level agreement. Service level agreement was more around average speed of answer, um, number of calls that went through to voicemail, for example. I believe those are listed in one of the, the statement of work documents. If you could go to the bottom of this page, please, uh, and if you could make the table at the bottom sl just slightly bigger, thank you. Uh, so we see, we see there's total calls um, so the third up from the bottom and a monthly call limit. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the monthly call limit? Um, I, I don't recall specifically. I, I could speculate that that's the document that was a contractual level that was put into a document um, so that if we, um, if, if the number of calls exceeded or significantly um, were less than this, it, w it would trigger a conversation uh, with post office um, around the, the, the volumetrics of the service desk and the cost of the service. It's standard for IT to have those threshold limits in there. We, we see that the, the, the calls range uh, in, in February 06 is mm -hmm. just over 13,000. Um, to uh, this 16,000 in January 07, 15, 15 and a half thousand in February 07. Mm. And in terms of the breakdown of, of different types of, of calls in, significant numbers through heart for hardware. Yeah. And at the bottom, there are, is a collection for a category for software as well. Can you recall or, or where we, we discussed discrepancies earlier. Mm -hmm. Which category do you think uh, discrepancies would fall into, reported discrepancies? Um, my assumption is that they would fall under software. Thank you. That document can come down. And if we could bring up FUJ 401966. This is a document dated the 19th of August, 2005, that says service level targets for Horizon services. Mm -hmm. um, so drafted just before, I think you started on the post office account. Yeah. At page eight, please. Thank you. We have the service level targets for, at the bottom, Horizon system help desk. 
And the first few are three, I think, are, are to do with calls answered mm -hmm. uh, and the proportion there. We then have level one calls resolved within five minutes, 95%. Do you recall what a level one call was? Um, I don't uh, recall exactly what a level one call was. However, it was something that would be able to be resolved at the service desk. Uh, and the same for level two, really. Do you recall the difference between that and uh, a level two call? Mm, so again, a level two call, uh, again, I don't recall. So that would be something that within the service desk, there was a level one and a level two um, sort of level of service. Um, so level two probably had more um, uh, more time. They, they, they took more time to see if they could resolve at first point of contact. Um, obviously, it's much more advantageous for post offices and, and for Fujitsu to resolve at the service desk rather than pass to a second or a third line support team. Um, so seeing this now has, has triggered the memory in me that there was a level one and a level two service desk within the horizon service desk. Um, I, I don't recall the difference um, between a level one and a level two call. So th this is saying of level one calls, mm -hmm. say, for example, 95% uh, should, should be resolved within five minutes. And as I said, for level two calls, those defined as level two, 95% uh, should be re resolved within um, 30 minutes. Uh, can you recall if there were any targets or guidelines and of the proportion of calls that come into the help desk, which should be level one, which should be level two, or which should be level three? No, I have no recollection of that. That document can come down, thank you. Uh, that monitors how the help desk, in terms of volumetrics, mm -hmm. re responded. Uh, how was the quality of the help desk, um, the, the advice actually given? How was that monitored? Um, so there was, uh, I believe they were called service controllers or uh, that or the team leaders would monitor and listen into calls. Um, that was then given feedback to specifically to agents. Um, again, I, I don't recall the percentage of calls that were listened into, but that was part of general service desk practice. Um, there was also a complaints process. So when we received a complaint or the Horizon Service Desk received a complaint, that would then be logged and then that would be investigated um, to determine if the complaint was a valid complaint or not. Let's move then to, the, to that assistance and how that was um, given. Can we bring up FUJ 307939? This is a post office account customer service incident management process mm -hmm. definition drafted on the 23rd of March 2005. Uh, this is for what we've called Legacy Horizon, or mm -hmm. what's known as Legacy Horizon, the version of Horizon in place from national rollout uh, until 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, you drafted the Horizon Online version of this document, is, yeah. is that right? Yeah, that's correct. But this is the document that you would have been working with or, or would have been used at the time that you were in post? Uh, yeah, this was drafted just before I joined, but yes, this is the process that we would have been working to. If we could turn to page eight, please. And the process objective under mm -hmm. 1.2 says the objective of this document is to define the process for incident management of the POA environment for the purpose of this document, an incident is defined as any event which is not part of the standard operation of a service and which causes or may cause an interruption to or a reduction in the quality of that service. So if, if a sub postmaster called the help desk with a possible software problem, um, that's an incident to be managed under this process. Is, is that that's right? Correct. Yes. Could we turn to page 12, please? So we have a flow chart here mm -hmm. um, showing at the top entryways into uh, a, a contact received by the POA service desk. Uh, SDU, is that service delivery unit? Correct, yeah. And what 
would in, in lay terms, what would a service delivery unit be? So um, the software support, the SSC was a service delivery unit. Um, so it was a team, a resolving unit, if you like, a resolving team that um, would work to resolve incidents. So a team within Fujitsu, um, such as the SSC yeah. or the SSC. Engin or engineering, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Zen user, which is presumably the sub-postmaster, mm -hmm. uh, system and, and service management, do you know what those are? So, so we could have system-driven um, alerts that would come in. Um, from my recollection, they would come from the data centres. If, the, if there are any um, system alerts, that could trigger um, an incident being logged at the service desk. And service management would be myself, my team, and the wider service delivery organisation. Users would also be post office limited as well, so not necessarily just sub postmasters. No. Yeah. Um, and we don't need to go through all of the this, this flow chart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it starts with trying to triage the query, basically. Yeah. Uh, and at the bottom, we see, uh, if we could just move down slightly, four types of outcome. There's, there's incident, which then follows this process in this mm -hmm. document. Um, Advise and, assist, advise and guidance, uh, answer inquiry and, and close or refer to MBSC. Out of scope, uh, th that's where for, it wasn't within the scope of the services provided by Fujitsu. Correct. And quality, mm -hmm. is quality looking at the quality of service provided by the help desk um, rather than the quality of the Horizon system? Um, from my understanding of the document, yes. On the help desk, how would the, uh, or what process was used or guidance was used for, to allow a, a help desk operator to decide whether it's an incident or, or something that needs to go to the MBSC? So the service desk would have had call scripts um, that they would go through, um, and that would help them then determine which of these four categories um, the incident would be logged or the, the, not necessarily the incident, which of the four categories would be applicable in this process? I'm just going to move forward, actually, because it, you, you've mentioned call scripts now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in your, your statement, you do say that the agents were provided with scripts, mm -hmm. predefined questions, which they were expected to use when providing support to the SPM. Do you recall who was responsible for drafting those scripts? The service desk... Um, team would have been responsible for drafting those scripts. However, they would have had an input from the service delivery units uh, or from service delivery management as well. And where were they held for the uh, operators to access? I, I don't know where they were held. Um, I don't know where that documentation was, was held. Um, I, I don't recall if it was actually part of the Power Help tool set. Um, in, in some service management tool sets, the script is actually in the, t in the software, so it prompts the agent what to, uh, what to say. Um, but I, in this instance, I don't recall where it was held. Do you recall if there was a general script to follow for all calls or if there were <laughs> individual scripts for specific um, issues raised by sub-postmasters? Um, again, uh, it wasn't actively involved in the in the day-to-day -day operation of the desk my recollection is that there was a um a script that initiated the conversation um you know greeting the post the the, the caller getting the post office branch id again i, I can't remember the, the correct terminology for that um and then obviously trying to capture specific information i think one of the documentations has has that in there one of the joint working documents actually lists out some of the scripts that needs to be said which we I may, I may have the documents in my mind which you're referring to. <laughs> uh, should we um, bring up FUJ 3080478? So this is a Horizon Service Desk mm -hmm. Joint Working Document. And we see at the bottom the you were an author on this mm -hmm. with John John Casey. Yes. So John was a 
one of the service desk managers reporting into Paul Gardner. Yeah. Um, please could we turn to page 13. So this section looks at the end-to-end -end incident management. And if we go down slightly, thank you. In under 4.1.1, the third paragraph down, then says, the moment an agent receives an incoming telephone call, they will greet the customer with the example shown below. All spoken words are marked in italics and in quotes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening. Horizon System Help Desk, agent name speaking. Um, may I take your branch code, please? And as we see, there are further scripts below that. Mm -hmm. Is this the document you were referring to yeah. then? Yeah, and this would have been part of the training that was given to the service desk agent um, before they took live calls. Are you aware if this document was converted into a, a more precise script, which would then be used by the help desk? Um, I, I'm not personally aware, um, but it would be my speculation that it was. This is, you know. Please could we bring up uh, now FUJ 0013873. I think this, this was a document that you were given this morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a process ID 408501, engineer refused access process. Summary, please use this KA. Do you know what KA stands for? I don't know. Knowledge would, article, perhaps I would hazard a guess at. A knowledge article, I, 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 that was what I was about to <laughs> suggest. But uh, yeah. if an engineer has called to advise, they have been refused access at a post office. Resolution. If an engineer has called to advise they have been refused access to the post office, please follow the below. Uh, Frontline process. And then two says HSD contact site and follows call script below in purple. Um, and we don't need to read it out, but there is then a, mm -hmm. a call script there for a specific um, uh, incident. In this case, engineer refused access process. Do you recall seeing items like this during your time uh, working with Fujitsu? Um, no, I, I don't recall seeing this. Um, to, again, I can speculate that this is the knowledge article that the service desk had um, that would they would refer to this in the event that they received a phone call from an engineer, engineer saying they, they didn't have access to site. W would you anticipate that there would be similar articles for, um, this is obviously engineer refused access, but say a sub-postmaster rang with a discrepancy uh, would you expect there to be scripts of the, a similar nature advising the operator how to deal with that? It would be my expectation, yes. That document come down, thank you. Do you recall ever uh, an instruction being given to help desk staff to tell sub-postmasters that they were the only person experiencing a problem that they had reported? No. Would you expect what would you say if such advice was given? I would say that would be erroneous advice. If we could um, please bring back up FUJ 3079939. Thank you. And if we could go to uh, page 15, please, paragraph 2.4. This sets out, uh, I think it's fair, fair to say, what the service desk was expected to do when uh, handling calls or incidents. And for, for the record, it says, the service desk agent then attempts to resolve the incident using the resources available this starts by interrogating HSH1. Do you recall what that, that was? I, I, I don't recall. Um, again, I can speculate that that was the term given to the system that housed the KELS, or it was a precursor to the, the knowledge database. I, I, that's a terminology that I don't recall. Uh, to find all information related to the incident symptoms, if the incident is routine, 
there is a predetermined route for resolution, then the incident is referred to the relevant SDU using the service desk support matrix in HSH1. So that, when you say SDU, that would be perhaps the SMC or the... Or engineering. engineering. Oh, yeah. He then goes on to say, if the incident is not routine, the service desk agent checks for known errors listed in HSH1 and the SSC KEL against records relating to the incident symptoms. If a match is found, the agent informs the caller of the workaround or resolution available and links the call to the master incident record. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the KEL database? Um, not in detail, I recall its existence. And do you recall whether m members of the help desk found that an easy system to use? I wouldn't be able to comment on that. I don't know. During your time um, analysing the core metrics, mm -hmm. etc., would you have needed to, to consider, um, for example, if there was an increase in, in delays in resolving... Um, calls within 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Would that be something you would look into? The reasons for the delay, sorry. Yeah, on, for the level one, level two on the service desk. Um, so anything that got routed to a service delivery unit, the only um, one that I would have had any involvement in is the engineering service um, and anything that was routed to cable and wireless or BT for the online branch services. The, the, the wasn't internet, ADSL as it was at the time. Um, but I wouldn't look into any of the software you, calls. Who would look into the software calls? Um, the SSC would be my assumption. So uh, let me look at, at, at so I put this a different way. When examining whether a s software, uh, a number of software calls had been resolved quickly enough and within service level uh, targets, would you ever have looked into whether the KEL database was an effective way or was effective in giving Horizon Service help desk operators information they needed to resolve level one and level two calls? The, the only metrics that I would have looked into were the level one, level two within the Horizon Service desk. So the, I, I, I don't know what the resolution timescales or the SLAs were expected to be for the service delivery units that were not part of my portfolio. Um, so I, I don't know what the SSC SLA was or what it was intended to be but going to the question looking at level one level two within the horizon service desk if we saw a deterioration or that service level metric wasn't being met we would look to try and understand what was the root cause of that so I don't have much longer to go but um, uh, for the transcriber I noticed we've been an hour so I wonder if we could have a, a short break yes by all means um, where are we now 11.30, all right? Uh, yes, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Good. See you then. Thank you. Thanks. Sir, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. I, just, I want to go back to the document we were on and at the same place, please. So it's FUJ 3079939. Um, paragraph 2.4. Sorry, 2.5. So we, we went to this paragraph beforehand, and, and this is where the service uh, desk operator couldn't resolve the problem using ACE HSH1, mm -hmm. and then checked for known errors listed in the same database, but also in the SSC KEL database that we discussed. Yep. Uh, and it said, if a match is found, so presumably if it matches to something in the, um, the one system or in the SSC KEL system, the agent informs the caller of the workaround or resolution available and links the call to the master incident record. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain what the master incident record was in that case? Um, so it's, it's common practice in a service desk to create a master incident record and then to append what we call child incidents to that master record. That then allows um, 
any service desk, or in this case, the post office service desk, to be able to capture metrics on how many occurrences of that incident there actually were, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a mechanism of saying, we have this major incident, and then there's appended other incidents beneath that. So for instance, with Calendar Square, I'm not saying this is what happened, but to use us as an example, there may be a master bug or incident, and then each time one is uh, identified in the field, in theory, that mm -hmm. should be appended to that incident as a child. That's the theory, yes. Um, is that different uh, to the, the KEL? So would the KEL be updated to show that the um, call had been raised and was a linked to the, the overall KEL? There, there would be a cross-reference between the KEL number and the number of incidents. So, again, this is my assumption that the master... Um, incident record would refer to the KEL and therefore you would be able to extrapolate that KEL 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 had X number of incidents associated with it. So in, in this case, if uh, there was a, a second incident of a similar um, or the same uh, materialisation of a bog, mm -hmm. we have the child, uh, you think that the there's a link to the actual KEL, so that on the KEL you can see incidents linked to it. Um, are you aware if that ever changed? So, so just to clarify, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that the KEL would show the number of incidents, but you could cross-reference the two data sources to achieve the same outcome. So you just, for, for clarity... Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Uh, that, that system that you've just referred to, mm -hmm. are you aware if that's ever changed during your time at Fujitsu? I don't believe so, no. Thank you. Can we turn to page 16, please, and uh, paragraph 2.6? If there is no match in HSH1 or the SSC KEL, the problem database is checked for current incidents outstanding. If a match is made, the call is then advised of the status of the problem, and the call is then linked to the master incident record given in the problem details. 2.7. If no match is made, then the problem database... Uh, sorry, if no match is made against the problem database... The service desk continues with first-line resolution of the incident, assisted by the product support engineers. Who are the product support engineers? I, I, I don't recall who the product support engineers were um, in this particular instance. Um, again, I could, I could speculate that they are subject matter experts associated with a particular um, software or hardware, but I don't recall specifically who the, the PSEs were in this particular instance. As it's articulated here, it appears that they're part of the service desk. So, and then 2.8, if the PSEs cannot resolve the incident, it is referred to the relevant SDU using the service desk support matrix in HSH1. Yeah. So if, is, is my understanding right that this, you follow this process, and then if this doesn't lead to a resolution, mm -hmm. it's then passed to second line support? So what would happen is um, if the, there's an incident is logged, and this is, this is gen sort of generic service management best practice, if an incident is logged, um, it's then validated to see if there's a known solution, a known workaround to get the service restored. That's the KEL uh, that would be looked in. Um, the KEL contained, um, or the knowledge database contains uh, how to resolve an incident, how to restore that, 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 that incident. The problem database would be open items um, which, for which the resolution hasn't yet been identified. So um, problem management is one level elevated to incident management. Um, and then the product support engineers, reading this now, they are subject matter experts in the service desk. And if they are unable to resolve, that's when it would get them and pass through to the service delivery unit. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. And that, <laughs> I, I suppose my question is that that's when it goes to second line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the help desk, in, well, in your experience, did the help desk follow this as a matter of course in practice, this system? Uh, yes, as a ma yeah, absolutely. That would be the system that they would follow. I can't say they followed it 100% of the time because there are humans involved in this, but that absolutely was the intent to check the KEL to see if there was a resolution, then to check the problem database and if it was unable to resolve to assign it through to the SDU. The KEL might actually stipulate in it, you need to pass it to the service delivery unit. 
So that could also be some of the information that's in the CAL. Mm -hmm. You evidenced earlier about when we discussed the lo log and flog, mm -hmm. Matty, you, you uh, discussed how there weren't many first line fixes available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we explored that, you referred to the number of hardware issues yeah. and we saw the level of calls that came mm -hmm. to do with hardware. And so those calls would be, of course, passed straight on to the engineering department yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Limiting it to software mm -hmm. uh, complaints, was this, were there still a limited number of first line fix available to the help, um, the help desk? when this process was followed? It's my belief that yes, there would still be only a limited number of fixes that the service desk would be able to do. Do you know why that was? Um, I, again, I, 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 my speculation is, is that they didn't have any ability to resolve software incidents and they had to go to the specialised teams. Um, it's very few service desks that are able to resolve software issues. I mean, mostly it's a reboot to see if that solves it, but um, that's why it's my, my belief that there was very limited um, first-level fix that the service desk could do in software incidents. Were the types of software incidents that were um, being presented to the help desk more complex than you would expect in other IT projects? Um, I I'm unable to comment on that. Again, the, the information that I saw was the breakdown of the number of tickets logged against specific power help codes. Can we go to a different document, please? Uh, it's FUJ 3079897. This is a 2003 document end-to-end -end support process mm -hmm. operational level agreement. And um, please can we turn to page six. <coughs> this sets out HSH, HIT and SMC obligations to SSC. I think we've covered all of those abbreviations say for HIT. Do you remember what that was? Um. It's well, according to the abbreviation definition in the document, it's the Horizon Service Desk Incident Team. And do you recall what that role, their role was? There was um, a subsection within the service desk. So service desk have, have it's not just agents that responded to calls. You also have team managers, PSEs, as I now remember, and incident management teams. And the incident management teams would look uh, at major incidents or significant incidents and make sure that those were passed through um, to either the service management team or managed in accordance with the incident management process, the major incident management process. So this document is looking at the, what's described as obligations for first and second line support collectively mm -hmm. to third line support. Uh, Subparagraph D, it says, to filter all calls for which the problem is already known to the support community, and for which a resolution is already known or has been generated. In this context, the term resolution can take a number of forms, including the statement that the problem is resolved in release X of the Horizon solution. There is a document of workaround for the problem. The documentation relating to that part of the system is under review or being changed. Uh, no calls passed to the SSC, which are subsequently resolved as known errors, except in cases where the symptoms reported by the customer did not match the symptoms recorded in the known error documentation and which therefore the SS HSH, HIT, SMC could not reasonably have been expected to find. So this is essentially putting into practice what you described earlier, that where possible first and second line support should resolve the calls that they can do. Mm -hmm. Are you aware if there was any um, consequences of or what happened when the SSC considered that a call had been directed up to them inappropriately? Um, they, my recollection is that they would refer that back um, uh, and we would try and have a closed loop process to understand why a call had been passed to SMC, which, or SSC, sorry, which shouldn't have actually been passed there because 
the intent is always to try and resolve as quickly as possible. So that's a, a, a failure in the process if something's gone through to a third line support team, which should have been resolved or could have been resolved by um, a level one or a level two desk. And, and to what extent was there pressure on people in the help desk to resolve calls themselves uh, rather than refer them up? Um, uh, again, I wasn't actively on the, involved in the day-to-day -day operation on the service desk. There was, um, you know, there was a, a requirement for them to follow the process correctly, but I wouldn't say that there was pressure on them to not pass calls through to second or third line. Um, you know, th there was no metrics on that, um, and the desk was operating on its on the metrics that we discussed in the previous documentation. So I don't believe there was undue pressure or any pressure for them to not refer calls uh, inappropriately. Could we turn to page, uh, I think actually, I think it's just over the page, subparagraph so M, and maybe to, no, yes, yeah, just, just further down, please. Thank you. We have uh, subparagraph so M, which is to filter all user error calls and ensure that they are closed. No calls passed to SSC, which are subsequently closed as user error. And then O, to filter all calls, calls for which the Pathware software, um, it says in, but is not at fault. No calls passed to SSC, which are subsequently closed as no fault in product. <coughs> From the help desk perspective, do you think the people working on there had sufficient expertise to be able to determine whether a um, call was or an incident was caused by user error rather than the software itself? The, the intent of the knowledge articles is to provide the knowledge to the service desk agent to, so that they should follow the script that's in the knowledge article and that would then determine whether it was um, how to route the call. Um, the intent of knowledge articles is to eliminate that need for in-depth knowledge for service desk agents. Um, so uh, I, I don't believe if, if the knowledge article was, was written correctly, then they should have been able to follow that and that would have then delivered the, the, correct, the correct outcome. That document can come down, thank you. Um, I've been asked to ask you if, if whether to your knowledge there were members of the help desk uh, who were ever advised to tell sub-postmasters uh, to accept discrepancies because they were caused by user error? Absolutely not, to my knowledge, that happen. Finally, uh, please could we bring up statement WITN 0666-0100. This is a witness statement from Amandeep Singh, who will be giving evidence to the inquiry later today, um, and worked at the help desk before your time at Fidgetsu uh, in 2000 and 2001 in Wakefield. Could I ask to turn to page three, please, of the statement? I'll just re read it for the record. It says, the floor on these days, and when it says these days, it's referring to Wednesdays when there was balancing issues. The floor on these days was most toxic with vocal characters in squad A, unchallenged by managers who looked away as all Asians were called Patels, regardless of surname. Shouts across the floor could be heard saying, I have another Patel scamming again. They mistrusted every Asian postmaster. They mocked Scottish and Welsh postmasters and pretended they could not understand them. They created a picture of postmasters that suggested they were incompetent or fraudsters. Were you aware of any such behavior on the help desk during your time at Fujitsu? No, not at all. And um, reading that, I find that absolutely appalling. I have no further questions, but before I ask if the core participants have questions, is there anything further you would like to say to the inquiry? Um, no, that's fine, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Steen has some questions, sir. Yeah. So, um, one area of, of questioning, it won't take long. Um, Seventh Jones, I represent a very large number of sub postmasters and mistresses, uh, all of them being affected by this scandal. Um, dealing with your knowledge of the support systems, 
Can you help me whether the first line support groups use the same incident logging system as the rest of the support chain? Um, now, first of all, do you want me to repeat the question? <laughs> Can you define support chain? Are we talking SDUs? Yes, well, I, I be, I'm quoting, in fact, from a document. It's a, a document after your time, narration mm -hmm. of these matters. So what I'm trying to find out is whether the original Horizon system had the same problem. So um, all I've got is that, um, that the first-line support groups, who I imagine are the helpline mm -hmm. support uh, um, providers, so if we look at it from that perspective, did they, in your time, use the same incident logging system as the rest of the support chain, which would then be the um, lines uh, two, three, and four? Um, to the best of my knowledge, the service desk used PowerHelp initially. Um, that then changed to Tiroli for service. PowerHelp, for, from an engineering perspective, was not the system used by the engineering. It transferred into a, a core services tool set that, that managed the engineering. Um, and to the best of my recollection, SSC, uh, from a software perspective, had access to the power help, but they tr they transferred it into their own tool or that, they, that they worked on. Right. So is, is the answer to my question um, that they didn't, in fact, use? To, to the best of my knowledge, um, I think different systems were used. Yes. Thank you. If anyone else? I do have some questions, please, sir. Yep. It's Flora Page also uh, representing a number of sub-postmasters. Can I ask, please, for uh, document FUJ00120049 to come up, please? And uh, if we can go to page six. Um, if we can go to uh, the definition of um, this is the this is I, I, I understand this to be something which would deal with problems which then go into what you've described as the problem database is that mm -hmm. right yeah yeah and so for, for, for clarity a problem is um, a, an issue that doesn't have um, a documented workaround or resolution so an incident and then you move into problem management, um, and then change management addresses the root cause that's in the problem. The kind of three flow through to each other. Well, as I understand it from this document, the mm -hmm. relationship between an incident, which we've already seen the definition of, and mm -hmm. a problem, is that um, the, the problem is defined as, uh, let's see if I can find it, um, It's that second sentence of the first paragraph there. For the purposes of this document, a problem with a capital P is defined as the unknown underlying root cause of one or more incidents. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think further down it tells us, and, we, and if you can confirm it from memory, we maybe don't need to, um, the, it was three or four incidents which created a problem. Uh, I, I don't think there's a specified amount of incidents that would create a problem. So you could actually have a problem. This is, again, the, the, the academic theory of, of service management. For any incident that you do not have a resolution for or a workaround that would restore service could trigger the raising of a problem. Um, and then that problem then should be investigated as to what the root cause is. Uh, and then that root cause should be removed from the infrastructure through the change management process. But in, in this document, and perhaps we can scroll down to see if we can find it, uh, I think it's right to say that it was, in fact, three or four incidents which were defined as, as becoming a problem. Um, I, um, I don't know. I, I, I can't see that in the document. The theory is any one incident can generate a problem, and um, perhaps in this document it stipulates two or three. Um, I, I, I think I... I don't see on here where it says that. Or 
all right, well, let's just stick with one or more incidents mm -hmm. then. Um, and uh, the incident we saw earlier was defined as any event which is not part of the standard operation of a service mm -hmm. and which causes or may cause an interruption to or reduction in. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Can I just have a look at how that translates into calls into the system? Um, and if we could bring up, please... Poll three zeros seven three two eight zero. And if we go to page five. Now, Page five shows us um, what seems to be a, a typical record of a call into the help desk. Is that right? Um, yes, that's what it appears to be, yes. Um, presumably, this is the sort of output of the PowerHelp tool. Is that right? Yeah, this is from PowerHelp, correct. Um, in this particular incident, we see that it's a call in on the 28th of January of 04. We see that in the middle of the top. Mm -hmm. And we can see that there's a box called problem text about halfway down, a little bit below halfway down. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a summary of what the caller says. The caller states that discrepancies are going through on the system, and this has been the case for three weeks in a row. Uh, and then it gives the amounts for the discrepancies. And then we also see a little below that, two lines below that, a text after it's, the call has been closed, and this appears to be a sort of a summary of why the call is closed. Mm -hmm. And it says, call closed by Diane Ma, NBSC issue, transferred for investigation. So that, that presumably is a, is a typical closure if the caller has been referred to the NBSC. That's my understanding from the text that's written on here, yes. And is it right also that we would we then can see below that non-horizon business as the product on the, and the description, and presumably that feeds in then to your metrics, does it, for how the call has been resolved? Yeah, if you refer back to the, the, the table with the, the graphs, one of those blocks would be related to NOC, would be calls classified as non-core or, or referred to, N I don't know what the, the terminology is, whether they're referred to NBSC or whether it's non horizon business so it would form one of those blocks on that that graph that we saw and I think you told us didn't you that you <coughs> from memory you didn't particularly remember discrepancies being their own type of resolution yes no no um, but we see here an example of how a caller about discrepancies mm -hmm. is resolved as non-horizon business yes yes that's what this is showing um and we don't necessarily need to go to them but there are uh then following this call from the same uh, from the same office, which is Marine Drive, it's it's a particular office which obviously this inquiry is going to, to hear a little about, um, there are then a number of calls about discrepancies mm -hmm. which are all basically resolved by being referred to the NBSC. Mm -hmm. So um, that is, a, is an example, is it not, of how calls about discrepancies would never turn into, or in this case, don't appear to have ever turned into, quotes, incidents or problems? Uh, in this particular instance, yes, this wouldn't have been investigated by Fujitsu. Um, however, the, the, the comment on the bottom of the screen that I can see there is that, that NBSC would then be able to refer that back to Fujitsu following their investigation. If you recall the incident flow, one of the inputs at the top would be from, from users or from the NBSC. So this could have been referred back into Fujitsu through, and I don't know if it did, but this could have been referred back through to Fujitsu from a post office account through the, um, through the processes and the yes. engagement that we yes, had. Yes, I understand. And, and it's right, I mean, we can um, indeed see that there is a bit of back and forth between NBSC and, um, and the Horizon help desk. Mm -hmm. Um, but absent it being escalated from the Horizon help desk, it can't become an incident or a problem. Or being escalated through NBSC, through post office, into Fujitsu, yes. Yes, I see. So NBSC could escalate it straight up the line, could yeah. they? Yes. All right. Um, thank you. Those are my questions. You're welcome.
So I think that's all of the questions from the core participants. Well, th thank you very much um, for coming to give evidence at the inquiry and for providing a written witness statement. I understand that you may have travelled from mainland Europe to give your evidence. I in did indeed, yes. <laughs> so if that's, if that's been inconvenient for you, I'm sorry, but I hope you'll be able to com combine it with something uh, which gives you some pleasure. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. If we may have a 10-minute break uh, before the next witness. Yes, certainly. Thank so you, what sir. time is that, sorry? Uh, which we say, it's, uh, 10 past 12, if we may, sir. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. Um, may I call Mr. Amandeep Singh, please? Repeat after me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give. The evidence that I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mr. Singh, as you know, my name is Ruth Kennedy, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Could you confirm your full name, please? My name is Amandeep Singh. Um, and you've given a witness statement for the to the inquiry. If we could turn that up, it's WITN 0666-0100. Um, have you got that witness statement in front of you? I do, yeah. Um, and if you turn to page three. Is that your signature there? Yes, it is. Um, and it should be dated the 13th of January 2023, is that right? That's right. Have you read through this statement recently? Um, I have, yes. And is it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. Um, if we could turn to paragraph one of that statement, so scrolling down. Um, you say that you worked on the Horizon Help Desk Support Desk um, at Wakefield between October 2000 and September 2001, is that right? That's correct. Um, what was your background prior to getting that job? Um, so the background to the, me getting the job was um, it was my industrial year from university. I was studying computing at Huddersfield University and we had to obtain um, a graduate work placement year. So the university found a placement for me. Um, I wanted to do something that was a bit more hands-on than what, what they initially found. So I, I found a role with ICL, which was going to be supporting uh, Epson printers and uh, I chose to take that role. So is this your first job? This is my first ever full-time, full role, if you like, yeah. Um, I had worked part-time prior to that. Uh, and when you joined, how many people were part of the Horizon Help Desk support desk? Um, so, sorry, just to backtrack, I, so I joined the Epson Help Desk initially, and at some point during the year, it merged to become that, um, when I think ICL and Fujitsu had some type of merger. And then it became, we were all transferred to uh, the Horizon Help Desk. Roughly, I think there was maybe six to eight teams. And each team had about maybe uh, about 12, 10 to 12 members. Are those the squads that you squads. referred to in paragraph yeah. two? Um, so how, how many squads did you say there were about? Um, I th I'm thinking maybe six to eight. I'm trying to really rack my brains between about six to eight. What did your role involve when you joined the Epson support desk? So my role was initially as, as a first line support engineer. We would support um, all Epson um, printer products that weren't related, Mac related, if you like. How did that change when it moved to the Horizon help desk? Um, so the, the role initially was supporting maybe technical people um, and the so that you'd get people maybe from organisations, people calling in, or even just generally IT savvy individuals, if you like, that had issues with their printer. Uh, and we would just talk them through it. Sometimes it'd be driver issues or printer driver. We'd navigate them through software, how they install drivers. If we couldn't then res you know, resolve their issues, we would then pass them on to a second line team. And, so, and they would, again, they were kind of more specialists and a bit more, maybe more technically 
able than what we were in the first line team. And I'm sorry, the question of how it might... <laughs> and what training did you receive when you moved over to the Horizon Help Desk? So we were all told we were going to be moving to the Horizon Help Desk. Um, initially, we, it was something that we weren't aware of what we would be doing. Um, but we, we got, uh, I think it was on a few days training, we got to see the equipment, uh, run some dummy transactions. We were in a, in a room where we, we learned how to use the software. We were given a booklet, common transactions, how to navigate and to do, for instance, like selling a stamp, for instance, or you know, routine transactions that maybe a postmaster would do. And that was the, the level of training that we received. Uh, roughly, I can, off the top of my head, I think it was about two or three days of training. You say in your statement, if we turn to paragraph four, so over the page, um, that you think it was su insufficient. Um, you say the support staff faced the initial challenge of basic training that was insufficient to fully support sub uh, support postmasters in the full array of tasks that Horizon was set up for. Yeah, I think that initially it was it was useful because we hadn't seen the software. We didn't. We, we, when you're when you're on a phone call, you have to visualize what the what the postmaster is visualizing and you know, what their what the transaction that they're trying to do. But we were just given routine transactions. I think we did one time where we had to to do the reconciliation uh, task. I think we had off memory. I think we did it once, but generally it was how we would go about doing certain transactions, and and that was it. But we didn't really know what the calls would be until we got on the, on the call because this is really the, the, the real inception of the, the help desk itself. So until the calls started coming through, we, we didn't know really what sort of level of support we would be providing postmasters. Um, and uh, the postmasters themselves quickly picked up how to do the transactions. It wasn't something that they were going to struggle with, but that's the level of support that we would get. I think where it was insufficient was it was the more complex transactions. I think that foreign currency exchanges and there was some, how they put checks through the system and, and there was things that we didn't come across originally. Um, so it, again, it was learning on the job and a lot of it was just trying to remember, look at your booklets and, and guiding a customer, you know, guiding the postmaster through certain transactions. And it was generally on, on that level. And that's what I meant by insufficient. It wasn't it was more than just routine transactions, which is what the help desk training was really all about. How many calls were you fielding from sub postmasters? Um, it, it felt initially at the start, we were sort of inundated really, to be fair. Um, so they were just a constant stream of calls tend to come. They did, they did used to obviously peak on Wednesdays, but it was, it was a steady flow of calls constantly. Right. You Why know, did they peak on Wednesdays? It was that that was a reconciliation day. So that was when the postmasters would then do their, um, if you like, the balance the books as, as such. Can you describe what that day was like from your perspective? Um, we would generally come in later because uh, we had we had different shifts to be fair. So there'd, there'd be the, the normal shifts that would come in, and that they would finish around five. But you'd always have certain teams that would have to stay longer because we kept the the desk, as far as I can remember, open longer for that day because you knew it was going to be a, a really heavy, heavy day. You, you you could be on the call with a postmaster for you know a few hours trying to help them, you know, to reconcile. And that was a that was very stressful days. And you say um, paragraph five of your statement, um, you'd gone from dealing with IT savvy people essentially, yeah. to, to people who'd never owned a machine before and weren't computer yeah. literate, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, like I said, I mean, this was 2000, early 2000s. A lot of postmasters had worked in their, you know, in their branches, for, you know, for decades in some cases, and they'd, they'd, they'd never been around even a, a personal computer. So it, it was not only introducing, you know, a personal computer into, into their lives, really, in some cases for the first time but it was then also giving them exposure to here now use this software and 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 some of them wouldn't you, you'd have to explain to them what the mouse was in some cases i mean they wouldn't know what you meant by a mouse i mean that's this literally this this is the age of the time that we were we were, we were dealing with with certain people not everybody but a lot of postmates were, were elderly some of them i mean 
a lot of them weren't IT literate at all. I mean, generally the pub public, you could say at that time, not many of them were either, but, you know, and, that's, and that brought its anxiety and stress, you know, to, to postmasters themselves and as, and as well as to us too, because we had to explain sometimes maybe a complex transaction, but knowing that they themselves were not very literate in terms of just orientating themselves around the, you know, the, the screen trying to pick the right uh, the transaction, the right icons, and you'd have to describe the icon on the screen in, in, in detail, go, yes, press that. Now you're seeing another screen. And, and so it, it was really uh, trying to guide them as much as you could. And, and that itself did bring a level of stress because you was consciously aware that other calls were coming through. There was a backlog of calls and, and you, you, you knew that that call started somewhere, but it would end somewhere. And it was trying to get them to that resolution point. And sometimes you would just feel a bit deflated in terms of how can I get this person to that end point where they're not really capable of what I'm sometimes getting there. What training, if any, did you receive in how to deal with people of different computer literacies? Nothing. Um, were there any particular types of problems that you were asked to be ready for or examples of issues that sub-postmasters may face that you were trained on? No, not that I can recall. Um, at paragraph six of your statement, um, you say that the floor was quite a toxic place. Um, could you tell us a bit about more about what you mean by that? So it's just to, to elaborate on the, the point that I've made about the, the postmasters themselves. So for me, this is my very first IT role. So I was like from dealing with people that were ringing in and wanted the help on their printers, were generally people that tend to know about you know, at the time it was Windows 95 or Windows 98, and you said you can install a driver, have you checked this, you know, how to run a clean cycle on a printer. All of this terminology, in many cases, was just over the head of a lot of posts, you know. And for me, it was a learning curve, because it was, without being too crude, it was a job. And I thought, well, I'm a uni student, I'm going to go back to uni. I'm just going to see it out and see this is what the world of work is like. But it was toxic because the the other members of the staff that were, if you like, the second line team, the whole second line team had been sort of abandoned and everybody had just merged into this Horizon help desk. So there was a, there's a hierarchy of the second line teams who we would never interact with as first line engineers on the Epson team because we, really some of them, we would hate having to put calls through to them because they would almost belittle you in some way when you would pass a call to them, like, can you not deal with this yourself? You know, there was there was a hierarchy of individuals say, we are we are really talented in, in engineers. You did the hate of just passing calls through them. So there was the, there was that dynamic where you didn't really associate with those guys well. And then when they were all brought in and everybody was equalized and on the same level, that caused a great deal of animosity. And then layer on top of that, you're now not supporting maybe graphic design agencies or media companies as second line engineers were doing. And now you're sporting, you know, an old lady in Wales that doesn't know what even a, a personal computer is. Um, it felt, I think a lot of them felt like the role was beneath them. And that animosity, that toxicity, just it just grew and grew. And people were, it became a bit like people were almost on the calls and they were almost shouting about, oh my God, I've got this person on a call. And, this, and it, it became almost comical to watch people frustrated and throwing their arms about and, 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 and making a scene about supporting somebody who can't do it. And obviously they weren't projecting it to the customer because it was going on mute, throwing their arms out. Oh, I've got this person. They can't believe I've got this. They, they don't know this and they don't know that. And... And you'd get that a lot from the, the members of staff that were, you know, the second line engineers, if you like. And it just, it, it just created an atmosphere that was just, it, you, you didn't really want to be there. The, 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 the people and the teams didn't want to be there. And, and like I said, it was just going through, the, for me, it was, it was going through the motions of just getting through, the, getting through each day. Um, and if we turn over the page, um, 
still in paragraph six, you mentioned some of the comments that you heard while you were there. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Um, yeah, because I wanted... Uh, the reason why I got contact with the, the, with the inquiry itself was because um, it, it felt a little bit like I didn't... I don't know how much that the... <laughs> it, it was going to be an inquiry about maybe senior management or people looking away a bit of people, you know, from top down dictating practices or something. And I wanted to just give you my real world experience of what it was like just on the help desk, on the floor. You know, it wasn't like this big brother element of senior management, just just my opinions on day to day of what it was like. And 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 what I wanted to get across was you had that element of where you had the the, the teams merging into one, supporting the postmasters, that resentment towards the role that they've, they've been now forced to take on. And then, and then you, you had another layer upon that with the, the cultural issues in some cases, many of these people were supporting, you know, you know Asian postmasters, not to put it in any in 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 blunter terms than that, but sometimes an Asian postmaster, they would ring up and they'd be like, I've got, Oh, I've got a £2,000 discrepancy. I've got a £5,000 discrepancy. In some cases, you'd get wild figures like 50000 or or 100000 And sometimes these figures people were, were quoting were, were, were more than most of the salaries, annual salaries of the individuals that they were supporting. And if you, like I said, if you layer upon that, that they're doing a job they don't want to do, then someone rings up and said, £15,000 is missing from my account. And... And people were like, oh, he's another one calling. And, and you would get so many of these calls, not just from Asian Post, but from everywhere, all walks of the, you know, from the UK, people were ringing in, and they would be saying these figures. Uh, and it's more than you know, a monthly salary, more than the annual salary of a lot of individuals, and think, well, well where's this money gone? And it just built that mistrust. And you know, I think at the time, there was always stories in the newspapers of somebody maybe frauding or defrauding or, or doing something. And if somebody rings you up and says, you know, fifty thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds is missing, and and you'd be like even you know, you'd question it, how can you miscalculate ten thousand or two thousand? It's not, you know, a couple of stamps here or there and you've you know you you can't reconcile to twenty pounds or thirty pounds. But these were these were huge figures that people were 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 quoting but and I think that that's what I meant that <laughs> Once that story got about, once somebody said, oh, I've got another Patel, and then you could just never get away from that whole Patel thing. And it would be like, who could come up with the most outlandish story? Oh, I've got a Patel, I've got another Patel. You just hear it constantly on the floor. And, and me, being obviously of an Asian background, there was me and there was another gentleman called Zubair. We were the only two ethnic minorities on the, on the support desk at all, on the whole entire floor. There was a Chinese gentleman or someone from a Chinese background, Peter. And that, that was, they were the, the, the only people of sort of colour on, on that floor. And at no point was anybody reeling it back and, and saying, well, what, what is this, you know, the language that was being used? And my grievance with it was that, that it, was, it was a case of why don't we just focus on the individual or the actual... There, this cultural dynamic, this mistrust that that was just feeding through. It felt like some individuals could never get beyond that, could never look beyond that, and 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 try and do the role that they were instructed to do. And and this this is one of the prime reasons I wanted to, you know, you know, get in touch with the with the with the help desk itself. How did that make you feel working in this environment? Um, I told myself every day that I'm here just for the year and I'm just seeing it and I was paid almost twice as much as nearly all the other uh, graduates that I knew so so I knew that I was well paid and for me I thought it's okay and, and, and speaking with from Indian parents to be fair and my parents my mum and dad go this is just work this is what it's like in the outside world you would just get told and that was really depressing to be fair that was to be told, and I just thought, wow, I've got a whole lifetime of this ahead of me, and this is what it's going to be like. So I goes, I better just get used to it. 
and I just used to go into work and go, right, okay. And nobody was, nobody ever said anything racial to me. I fit in with the team. I was with the most vocal team, which is squad A. And, you know, but nobody ever said anything personal to me. I fit in and I, you know, I was, you know, I could hold my own. I'm quite thick skinned. I mean, I, I grew up in that environment. So it wasn't difficult for me in many ways in such as, I look back now as somebody who's been and worked in his for almost 20 years and look back and think, and now, now having, you know, two boys, now having a young kids, thinking how difficult I would feel if they were in that environment. But me personally, I, I think I just, I find it harder now to look back than I did then, whereas when it was just a case of, let's just get through the day. It's another day, I'm earning good money, let's just move on. And that, that's what it was, but it was, it was difficult. I did know that a lot of conversations were going on, and it was a case when I would walk into a room, sometimes it would go quiet, and I knew that certain things wanted to be said by certain individuals, and so I would almost make an excuse to leave, to let them complete their conversation and go back, because I know that they wanted to say something. And it, and it was a case of managing that environment for me. But I really took it as a point of, this is something that I've got to go through and learn. And, and, that, and that was really sort of how I navigated my days, really. Um, turning back to your statement, if we look at paragraph seven, um, you say, as for their reconciling issues, the sub-postmasters, um, when we could not help them with their um, accounts, this would mean we would we spent a few hours on the phone going through each transaction and trying to figure out where the financial discrepancy was. We would eventually give up and we were advised to write off the loss as a discrepancy. This was a word you could hear from every agent's calls. Um, do you want to elaborate a bit more on your experience with this? Yeah, and just to caveat what, what I'm saying, I did feel that every agent no matter what they said, they did try their best to get, you know, to try and help every every postmaster that, were, were, you know, that they called up. But the Wednesdays days, you would, and bearing in mind that none of us were from an accountancy background, we're just, you know, IT people, but we would almost be bookkeeping live with an individual for entire week's transactions, trying to get down where did they get this discrepancy from. So it would be like, how many let's, uh, stamps did they sell? How many foreign currency transactions? So these are the transactions. That's what you're supposed to have. We would go line by line through every single transaction, trying to understand where did this discrepancy come. That's why the call would take hours. This is why you had to almost, you know, physically, you know, build yourself up to sometimes the calls when you knew when you when, when somebody would call them and go, they've got a discrepancy for you know a few thousand, and you know, right, okay, this is going to be a difficult one. And you'd go through all these transactions, and the postmasters themselves were always quite frantic. They were, they were, you know, they were so stressed. How do I get this? How do I? How have I got this figure? How am I going to reconcile this account? And so, you know, we would we would work with them work for hours. We would really try our best to get down to, it. and then, you know, we, we we couldn't resolve it. We'd, we'd go to we have like a team leader, sometimes floor walkers, and ask their opinions. Have you checked this? Have you checked that? We'd go back and, and try and, and resolve it. And if we couldn't, it, j it would just be right. Like, okay, it's a discrepancy. We'd say right to it offer a discrepancy. We we can't really do anything more beyond that. And it just be it almost became the norm in a way. And you'd have postmasters did say, I had one last week. I was like something like forty six pounds. It was small figures. They would say, look, I've put money in myself just to circle it just to, you know to square the circle if you like get it to a, a zero balance there was i've been doing it now for weeks so i've been and it was only when it got these extreme figures these big figures that they would they would they would call in and then you'd find that that's when they did help sometimes when they were small figures they'll tell you oh we've been putting money in ourselves just to get it zero and like i said they, it, we, you could just hear the word discrepancy it was probably the most <laughs> used word as well on on every call oh you've got a discrepancy that's like I said. It, it quickly went from how do I do this transaction? After a few months, people knew, knew all the transactions. How do I reconcile it? Then nearly everything was just discrepancy, discrepancy, discrepancy. That's what the, that's what calls were really about. People just not getting being able to, you know, reconcile their accounts to zero. When you say we were advised to write off the loss as a discrepancy, who was advising you? Um. So now I, I really tried to rack my brains on this one because we, we 
because there, there was a there, we had a, a management team that were, that were, were in the help desk that they were in the sort of the way that the help desk was located. You had the managers that would sat, would sit in the middle of the the help desk, and I and I was trying to rack my brains and who was telling me. And I remember it would be sometimes sometimes it would be um, like just one of the people in our team that were the the the, the most able on the software. And you'd, you'd cross-reference it with some of your colleagues. And then I think they, they, they put in some team leaders type in place because the managers themselves, they didn't know nothing. They, they never touched the software. They didn't do any training. You'd only go to your managers if you wanted to get a holiday. You'd go to them and go, can I have a holiday book? And that was it. And, and the managers were acutely aware that the floor was struggling. So they almost strategically picked out people out of each squad that were the most able on the software and sort of made them like floor walkers or team leaders or advocates, if you like. And you'd go to them and say, right, okay, I'm struggling. And they would go, well, there's nothing we can do, just a discrepancy. And that was it. It was never the managers. They, they, I mean, I, like I said, other than signing holidays, I don't know what they did. They weren't, like, these days, if you look at call centres, you have people listening into calls, reviewing calls. In the year that I was there, I honestly can't tell you what they did other than sign our holidays. Uh, you know, sign off holidays or we'd ask them for that. And there were, there were a good few of them. There was a good five of them, five, six of them. And it, and it was a gripe that most of the engineers had as well, that what, are, what is their role? What, what do they do? Because we needed help. We needed guidance. And, and we, we didn't really get it. So it was your colleagues. To answer your question, it was kind of your colleagues. And then... The floor walkers, which were nominees, which were again your your colleagues that you would go to. So there wasn't anyone in a senior or a management role that you told, and that's again one of the reasons why I wanted to contact the. Because it, rather than saying it was some sort of mythical big bad manager that was telling you or whatever or guiding you, in the very initial year that I was there when it was set up, it it, it felt very much like a rudderless ship really, and that you were just guide it somehow on your own and I think it, and it probably stems from all the other issues that I've raised just the lack of management in, in that interaction across the floor do you think genuine issues with Horizon were missed because of the toxic culture um, being there only a year it's, it's very difficult to ask that question or sort of to answer that question sorry I think it didn't help it, it, it really didn't help because if people were genuinely having software issues, but if you've already got a pre-built prejudice that you can't trust the people or the people are incompetent, and that's really, like I said, the, the number of the issue for me, is if you've already made a judgment call on the people that are supporting or you're supporting as incompetent or corrupt in some way, it, it would take a lot for people to go, you know, that, the software has an issue because I think people were, where we were much happier to in the floor to push down onto the postmaster because this is your issue or you're not correct or you've got the issues than anyone on the floor going pushing this upwards and go is there an issue here how can we have so many of these calls like I said, we didn't know who to push up to and the managements there were were just not were just not visible like I said just not what don't know what they did so you can see it must have taken s almost like a snowball effect of ever, ever, for someone just to look into this issue to go, surely we can't have this many discrepancies. So you can see how it must have just snowballed. And like I said, I was, I was only there for a year. So it maybe just grew and grew. And eventually, just through you know the, the number of issues and discrepancies, that's how it must have got through. But I, I don't think the, the, you know, the people's you know, pre-built prejudice, I don't think they helped at all. Because we could, you could, they could never empathise with the postman. They could never understand the issues, even when they were upset and crying on their phones, which we had all the time. Really upset individuals trying to understand, trying to you know, you know, get their accounts to zero. But you know, it, it, I think it, it's difficult. It's very simplistic to just to, to just say that. I think there was uh, other issues involved, but I don't think it helped. Is there anything else you wanted to say about your experiences to the inquiry? Um, I mean, like I said, um, 
they would be more personal on me in terms of how I felt as an individual. And I don't want it to blur the fact that this is an issue about postmasters and, and basically about the post office itself or you know, uh, and their own issues as opposed to, as opposed to how I, I really felt. I think it just, it, to me, it was a, a lot of issues at the time, just a lot of inch issues of just like postmasters, their technical capabilities, a lack of absence of management of people. And, you know, and I, I know that now they've got like first, second line teams and problem management or change management. All this. When I was there, they had to start one team it was immature. Now I can look back and having a, you know 20 years of an IT industry, I can look back and say, just the people themselves, the manager were, were not qualified to do the job. The individuals, some of them, should never have been supporting. It, it, it looks just you know with hindsight, and it's easy with hindsight to say these things, but there were just culpability on, on so many levels, on so many areas, um, and it's probably good to have this the re, the review to look uh, just from an organisational point of view of how how these structures when they're not there that's that's how issues like these can arise when you don't have the change management when you don't have problem when you don't have analysis and we didn't have much of that stuff going on and we have an absence of management or people not probing to look into why we why there are issues and you know this is why this, you know since then you have these ITIL standards or service desks you have just things that don't exi didn't exist at the time. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I don't have any more questions for you. Okay. Um, Mr. Steen has a question. Mr. Singh, I represent a large number of sub-postmasters and mistresses. Um, can we just um, uh, describe, please, the area where you worked um, so that the uh, inquiry can, under can grasp whether you worked in, in booths or whether you worked in a, a large open floor space. Uh, could you just describe the area you worked? It was a large, uh, a large area. Um, we had our own desks, but they were segregated slightly by the squads that you worked in. So you sat with your squad, but it was very much an open desk. There were private booths, so it was very much open. Um, so if somebody's shouting out from uh, your squad, would another squad be able to hear that across the floor? Yes. You mentioned the floor walker system, and you've also um, uh, spoken about managers. In your statement, you say this, that when uh, people were being vocal and toxic in what they're saying, um, that they were unchallenged by managers. And I quote from your statement, that uh, they looked away, the managers looked away, as, agent, as all Asians were called Patels, regardless of surname. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever see a manager uh, discuss the behavior of the individuals who spoke in that way? Never. And I, I've now been obviously 44 years old and not and someone who was like 21 at the time. I would challenge that. But then I think these days, it's very rare you would need to challenge that sort of behaviour. But at the time, there were some very strong world characters there, and who had almost, you know, rough shot. They could ride rough shot over whatever they wanted to say. They, they wanted to say, but it, it was a case. Oh, he's a character. Are oh, there characters? And we just let them go. We we leave them to it, if you like. They never challenged them. But then. Like I said, other than signing our, you know, holidays, asking for holidays, I don't think they did anything, those managers. I mean, I look back now and think, you know, it, the, the, the bureaucracy that there must have existed for have so many managers, which then led on to other managers. And, and neither of them, you, could, you couldn't really define what their role actually was. Two last points. Do you by any chance remember the name of the manager that you were um, directly dealing with? Was there a single individual that you would have described as being your manager? And if so, can you remember their name? Uh, I can remember their name. Um, so mine would have been Geraldine McEwen, I think it would have been. Thank you. Uh, and lastly then, um, you've said that you don't want to confuse issues between the effect on you uh, versus what was happening to the sub-postmaster's mistresses. Was the effect upon you 
of what you were going through in that period of time, was that something that inhibited or stopped you from, as an example, trying to take it any further within the organisation? Um, taking it further was never a thought in my mind. I, I'm going to be bluntly honest with you. I couldn't wait to get out of that role quick enough. And I did see it as a fact that this is a rite of passage for me. It's something of coming of age, doing my, doing my role, doing my time. And the best way to describe it is like if you're in prison and, you're t and you've got the tally charts and you're crossing the days off to go, right, I'm going to leave on that day. And like I said, I was well paid. And I, did, I didn't want people to think that it, it affected me, the language as well, on the floor. So I didn't want anyone to think that I'm just weak in some ways or that I've got an issue with it or I've got a chip on my shoulder or this language. Or I, so just it was easier for me to just go... Let's just see it through. It's fine. And one thing I did want to mention is that it's, it's, <coughs> it's very much an issue of, I feel, having worked, like I said, predominantly within, within the South, within London, within the banking industry, that it's, to me, it's very much a cultural issue of Yorkshire, of Wakefield, of communities that don't mix and are mistrusting of each other. And this is why... I wanted to raise the issue of this is why people that were hiring the incompetence, the incompetence level of it, if you're supporting people from Wales and villages in Wales and in Scotland, and if you're, and it predominantly is a lot of Asian people owned Postmark, is for you to understand the people as well that you're going to be supporting and, you know, be able to put yourself in their shoes and walk their, you know, walk in, in, walk in their shoes and understand their life situations. And the people that they were having supported them could never do that and almost incapable of doing that. And I think that's, that's one of the issues that I wanted to sort of raise as well. Thank you, Mr Singh. Thank you. Um, Chair, I don't think there are any further questions from any further core participants. All right. Well, Mr. Singh, I'm very grateful to you for drawing these matters to my attention and for making contact with the inquiry and begin, being determined to give oral evidence about these things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Chair, that concludes the witness evidence for today. Um, we're back tomorrow with Mr. Andrew Dunks. Yeah, fine. All right, then, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you.